committee will come to order. Let me begin by thanking you for being here today. This past March, a novel strain of H1N1 influenza, commonly known as swine flu, was reported in Mexico. Several people died and the virus spread quickly. Just three months later in June, the World Health Organization declared that this strain of swine flu to be a pandemic, the first global pandemic declared since 1968. According to the CDC, by the end of August, this new virus had spread throughout the United States, resulting in more than 9,000 hospitalizations and over 600 deaths. At first, some scientists feared that this could be a pandemic disaster on the scale of the Hong Kong flu of 1967, of 1957, or worse, the Spanish flu of 1918. At this point, however, it appears to pose much less of a threat. Nevertheless, there is great uncertainty about the course of this flu. And it is this very uncertainty that I think concerns people most. If there is any good news, it is that so far, this flu strain has not caused the number of deaths that some had feared. <clears throat> but why? What did the experts see then that they are not seeing today? And what does this foretell regarding how this virus may behave? Although dangerous mutations have not yet occurred, is this still a possibility? What does the experts expect and what do the best assessments now suggest? Public health officials believe that vaccinations is the best means to protect against this flu. We understand that a vaccine has been approved and is in production. But ever since the swine flu vaccine fiasco of the late 70s, people have been cautious. Today we want to discuss questions that I believe the public has about the benefits and risk of the new vaccine. We want to understand whether it is necessary, whether it is available, who will get it, and when will they get it. The more information that can be made available regarding these questions, the better the public and other key stakeholders can assess both the risk and the benefits of receiving this important vaccine. With the swine flu virus spreading rapidly, hundreds of thousands of healthcare workers, many in my state of New York, are now being required to get flu shots. Concerns have been raised about mandatory immunizations. In fact, there is a protest underway right now in Albany, New York, which highlights the concern that some have regarding mandatory vaccinations. I want to carefully examine these concerns today with our witnesses and find out as to why. In addition, the Chamber of Commerce estimates that during a normal year, United States businesses lose an average of $10 billion as a result of the flu. It could be doubled that this year, and many businesses that are not adequately prepared may not be able to function given the number of workers that could be absent. Fortunately, we have the three leading experts on these issues with us today, and we're happy to have them. I welcome all of you and look forward to your testimony. I will now yield to my ranking member, Mr. Darrell Issa of the state of California for his opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And thank you for holding this always timely hearing. Today we will examine the H1N1 pandemic flu, and many will say we're not examining it for the first time, and that is true. As a matter of fact, we are not ex examining it and other causes of pandemic outbreaks for the last time or the second last time, or perhaps the thousandth last time. It is very clear that the flu, flu, the flu virus can mutate as it migrates. 
It has in all the years uh, since the many outbreaks, including the, uh, the so-called Spanish flu that was so devastating to our soldiers from Fort Riley, Kansas, two generations ago. Unlike then, we understand now that there are steps that must be taken. Today we'll hear not just about the virus and not just about vaccines, but about a series of steps that must be taken now and in the future in preparation for an effective response. If we have an effective uh, vaccine today, we have it for today. Tomorrow is yet another day, and those vaccines that worked yesterday likely do not respond next year. Moreover, this committee has previously talked about and, and heard witnesses on the, uh, the annual flu shots people receive and the questions about that. This committee was very, very involved and properly so in the provisions of the Public Readiness and Emergency Preparation Act, or the acronym PREP Act, which in fact went a long way toward creating an environment in which our government could encourage the development of these vaccines at great cost without the liability being beyond uh, economic advice of their counsel. We must continue to do so. We must work on a bipartisan basis to recognize that, for example, the Veterans Administration, which plans to make available more than 3 million H1N1 vaccine doses this year, does so to federal workers and veterans without fear of lawsuit because, in fact, they have a liability exemption. But that's not true of the broader market. So as we talk about the, the requirements we have and the chairman's talking about protest against these vaccines, we must bear in mind that there will always be two schools, those who will rightfully so sue us or threaten us if we don't respond and we don't prepare and we don't have a vaccine, and those who will respond and protest and sue if we do. Mr. Chairman, I hope that this committee will in fact dedicate itself as the premier oversight committee of the Congress to do this on an annual basis. Because as, as much as people may say, well, we've heard about it before, the flu of next year is not the flu of this year. The pandemic of this year may pale in comparison to the pandemic of next year. And as we, as a Congress, support the efforts of various organizations, both public and private, to implement a national strategy to make us as invulnerable as possible we have to realize that nothing changes faster than the flu. With that, I yield back and look forward to uh, the hearing. Thank you very much. Um, any other members uh, seeking recognition? Gentleman from Maryland, Mr. Cummings. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I, I certainly thank you for holding this hearing today uh, on the administration's flu uh, vaccine program. The H1N1 virus has been taking the world by storm since April of 2009. The United States Secretary of Health and Human Services, Kathleen Sebelius, renewed the declaration that a public health emergency exists nationwide in, involving this virus. As the government prepares for the 2009 flu season, we must take every measure to ensure that all Americans, but especially populations of concern, including children and the elderly, are well prepared for the increased spread of H1N1. At least 46 U.S. children under the age of 18 have died from the H1N1 swine flu infection since April. H1N1 is flu is a, a new virus, so people may have little or no immunity, which means that the virus may spread more easily from person to person. In my state of Maryland, we are on a widespread uh, activity alert, meaning that outbreaks of the flu or flu-like illnesses have been reported in at least half of the regions in the state, and there is recent evidence of lab confirmed influenza in the affected regions. In fact, H1N1 is now the predominant strain of flu in the state of Maryland. Currently, Maryland has had eight deaths and over 170 hospitalizations due to H1N1. So I'm curious to learn from our witnesses how the administration will address the areas that have been hit the hardest. And we have 235 days left in the flu season, and vaccinations are expected to be available within a, in a few weeks. Education around the importance of the seasonal flu vaccine has helped millions of Americans see the importance and value in receiving this treatment. However, with something as common as a flu shot, people are still resistant. People are afraid of potential side effects. 
They are concerned that they will actually get the flu from the inoculation. And there are those who just do not believe that flu shot uh, will be effective. Last year, an Iran interest-based survey of some 4,000 U.S. residents, results showed that 46 percent of adults for whom flu vaccination is strongly recommended, meaning those with underlying conditions, those over 50, those in close contact with infants, the ill, Mr. Chairman, and the elderly, had no intention of getting the vaccine. Similarly, those especially vulnerable uh, to flu are not getting the vaccine either. In that study, it was reported that 52 percent of people with asthma had no intention of getting the flu vaccine. With the current state of apathy towards the seasoned flu vaccinations, I'm worried that there will be the same or even a worsened uh, case of apathy towards H1N1 vaccine. Since the, and as I close, since the initial outbreak uh, earlier this spring, the media has put a strong emphasis on H1N1 virus and the need for children to get vaccinated. However, there is some concern about whether all of the hype is really necessary. The Center for Disease Control estimates that an average of 36,000 people die from seasonal flu each year, while the CDC's own data shows that so far there have been fewer than 1,000 H1N1 deaths. Certainly, I know that this hearing will shed light uh, on this subject. And uh, one thing that we need to keep in mind, Mr. Chairman, is that uh, it is better that we be cautious and err on the side of caution and making sure that our people is protected, no matter what uh, their reluctance might be. And if we, have a, if we have a safe vaccine, which I do believe we have, uh, we need to make sure uh, that we do everything in our power, power to convince the public that it is important that they take advantage of it. And with that, Mr. Chairman, I thank you and I yield back. I'd like to thank the gentleman from Maryland for his statement. And now you have five minutes to the gentleman from Ohio. Mr. Kucinich. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> I want to welcome our witnesses. Uh, this is an opportunity for still another civics lesson uh, through this committee. And that is that we have public health officials here who are once again demonstrating the primacy of the government's role in matters of public health. Uh, that we have here, oh yes, a government-run flu vaccine program. Why? Because government has the resources and the ability to distribute in the public interest and to protect the public health uh, medical uh, means and materials, in this case flu vaccines, that can be important to protecting the health of the people of the United States. Uh, this is uh, one of the purposes of the government. At this very time, Mr. Chairman, uh, a Senate uh, su committee is meeting on uh, a public option for health care. And I want to connect the two because uh, the fact of the matter is, with tens of millions of Americans without access to primary care, if you don't have access to primary care and you get the flu, the effects of the flu can be much more damaging. You don't have to be a doctor to understand that. You also may be uh, more medically compromised than other people and therefore be even more vulnerable to being able to uh, uh, contract an influenza. So we have to use this opportunity to explore cause and effect here as well. Because what we have to deal with the influenza issue here, uh, swine flu is one thing, inf uh, more generalized type of flu and other. Uh, but we also have to realize that this occurs within the context of a health care system which is in and of itself a weakened system. And we reflect on Congress's responsibility to strengthen it. So I want to thank uh, Dr. Frieden, Dr. Fossey, and Dr. Goodman for their uh, presence here today. And we look forward to your testimony as to how we can prepare the American people uh, for this uh, influenza season. Uh, but we also have to understand uh, that there are things happening in healthcare in America which make our constituents uh, even more vulnerable to every manner of, uh, of flu and, uh, and generalized pandemic that can ensue, not just this season, but any season. And to look at the underlying question here is one of the things that Congress is certainly going to be involved in in the next uh, few months. 
So, Mr. Chairman, with that, I yield back. Thank you. Yield to the gentleman from Illinois. Thank the gentleman from Ohio for his statement. The gentleman from uh, Illinois, Mr. Quigley. Wave. Wave. Thank you. We introduce our witnesses today. Dr. Thomas R. Frieden, good to see you. Director of the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, Dr. Frieden has been trained in internal medicine, infectious diseases, public health, and epidemiology. Before being named director of the CDC in June 2009, Dr. Frieden was the commissioner of the New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene. Dr. Fauci, Dr. Anthony S. Fauci, director of the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases at the National Institute of Health. Dr. Fauci, a native of Brooklyn, New York, advises the White House and the Department of Health and Human Services on medical and public health preparedness against emerging infectious disease such as pandemic influenza. Our next witness is Dr. Jesse Goodman, the Food and Drug Administration Acting Chief Scientist and Deputy Commissioner for Scientific and Medical Programs. Previously, Dr. Goodman, an infectious disease expert, was the director of FDA's Center for Biologics Evaluation and Research. Gentlemen, it is a long-standing policy that we swear all of our witnesses in. And so if you would stand and raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? If so, answer in the affirmative. You may be seated. Let the record reflect that they answered in the affirmative. So Dr. Frieden, well, we will start with you and then come right down the line, okay? And let me just say that we have five minutes. To, when you start, the light is green. And then as you move forward, it becomes yellow, which is saying that you have one minute to summarize. And then after that, it becomes red. Red all over the United States means stop. <laughs> okay, <laughs> you may proceed. <laughs> Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member Issa, and members of the committee. In the spring, I was New York City Health Commissioner, and we had hundreds of thousands of cases of H1N1 influenza. At that time, we didn't have as clear an understanding as we do today of the level of illness it causes. We had health care settings that had a great deal of difficulty dealing with the large numbers of patients coming in. We had intense media interest, and tragically we had some people who became very severely ill and some people who died. So H1N1 influenza is something that we have to take extremely seriously. And what I'd like to do is update you briefly on the situation and on our response. As of today, H1N1 really never went away from the spring until now. It continued to spread over the summer, in summer camps and elsewhere, and when schools came back into session and kids went to college, we saw large numbers of cases. Influenza is now widespread across the United States, and in fact, this is uncharted territory for an influenza season. We've had already many millions of cases, and we will have many millions of cases more. So far, there has been no change in the pattern of illness. So the level of illness with H1N1 is no more severe than seasonal influenza. And intensive laboratory studies have shown no change in how deadly the virus is or no, and no significant change in the genetic makeup of the virus. That's good news because it indicates that so far, it doesn't seem that it will become more deadly in the immediate future and so far, it seems like the vaccine, which Dr. Fauci will speak about more, will be uh, uh, an excellent match against the specific virus that's spreading now. However, 
influenza is probably the most unpredictable of all infectious diseases. There are many variables and only time will tell what will happen, whether it will become something that uh, becomes more deadly is something that we just don't know until time comes. Therefore, the role of the CDC, much of which made possible because of the support of the Congress over several years, is several fold. We currently have more than 1,500 staff working on H1N1 response. The activities include the identification and characterization of the virus, identifying a candidate strain, monitoring the spread of disease in the U.S. and globally, and responding through communications with the public, guidelines for schools, businesses, healthcare providers, and a vaccination campaign. The vaccination campaign is an unprecedented effort. It's a public-private partnership with substantial amounts of vaccine coming available in the weeks to come. Production is rolling, and our choice was to let it build up in warehouses, then send it out, or what we decided to do, send it out as soon as it becomes available off the production line and its safety and potency has been verified. That means that over the next several weeks, there will be some vaccine in the system but there will also be some roughness as it gets distributed. Eventually, there will be enough vaccine for all who want to be vaccinated. The priority are people who are at higher risk of becoming severely ill, pregnant women, those with underlying conditions, school children, con contacts of people under the age of six. The vaccine will be free in public settings and in private settings, there will be no cost of the vaccine, although some settings will charge an administration fee. There will be up to 90,000 different providers across the country providing vaccine, and the challenges are significant. This is a shared responsibility of the federal, state, and local governments, of the healthcare system, of individuals, of businesses, and of the manufacturers who are partners in this process. Progress has been possible because of the ongoing investment by Congress. We're working hard with our partners in HHS under the leadership of Secretary Sebelius and the U.S. government generally and state, local, tribal governments as well as health care providers. And we're committed to regular open communications with the public and the Congress. It's an evolving situation and we're committed to staying open and answering your questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Fachi. Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, uh, thank you for giving me the opportunity to review for you the role of the National Institutes of Health, their research endeavor, and the preparedness and response to the 2009 H1N1 influenza pandemic, particularly in the arena of the development and testing of vaccines against this new virus. The National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Disease has been involved in basic and clinical research related to seasonal influenza for several decades and we have the responsibility for the development of rapid diagnostics for the flu, the development and testing of antiviral drugs, the understanding of how the influenza viruses evolve, how they mutate, how they transmit, what immune responses are induced, and importantly, we're deeply involved in the development and the testing of vaccines to prevent both seasonal and pandemic influenza. This latter effort is a collaborative process among several agencies of the federal government, particularly the sister agencies represented here in the Department of Health and Human Services in partnership with the pharmaceutical companies that actually manufacture the vaccines. As schematically shown on the first poster over there on the right, the development of an influenza vaccine is a stepwise process starting with the isolation of the virus up to and including the actual development of a new vaccine for distribution. In this regard, the 2009 H1N1 pandemic influenza virus was first isolated by the CDC and made available to a number of parties, including us at the NIH, for the purposes of studying its characteristics. Pharmaceutical companies with which we have longstanding relationships in the development of influenza va vaccines were given what we call seed or reference viruses for the purpose of developing pilot lots for the NIH to test in clinical trials. Historically, our institute has set up a network of vaccine and treatment evaluation units throughout the country. These groups have extensive experience in the conduct of vaccine trials 
and were called upon again to answer several important questions that would inform how we would use the H1N1 vaccines in this country and worldwide. The important information gained from these clinical trials involves safety, even though we have safety data from decades of experience with seasonal vaccines, which are made in the same manner. Also, immunogenicity, or simply put, does the vaccine elicit a response that would be predictive of protection against this virus? For example, what is the correct dosage and the number of doses? If we require the use of an enhancing substance called an adjuvant to amplify the response and spare doses, would this be safe and effective? Also, we need to know about the effect of the vaccine in special populations, such as the elderly, children, and pregnant women. As shown on the next poster, we have several ongoing trials that have already provided extremely valuable information for the implementation of our vaccination program. I can report today some good news regarding these clinical trials. For example, it was unclear at first whether this vaccine would induce a protective response at all, and if so, would it require an unreasonable dosage and or a number of doses to achieve this effect? We now know that a single dose of the standard 15 micrograms of vaccine in adults and the elderly without the need of an adjuvant is not only well tolerated, but induces a robust immune response in a high percentage of recipients. This is very important finding and has important implications for the supply of vaccine, as well as for its effectiveness in protecting our citizens, as well as people throughout the world against the pandemic influenza. In addition, we found that very similar to the seasonal flu vaccine, one dose of the 2009 H1N1 vaccine induces a robust response in children 10 to 17 years old, indicating that they will require only one dose, while younger children will likely require two doses, which is quite similar to the case with seasonal flu vaccine. Current studies are ongoing in pregnant women, and we hope to have preliminary data within a few weeks. In addition, we are planning to conduct vaccine trials in individuals who might have particular difficulty with the H1N1 virus, such as asthmatics and individuals with HIV infection. In summary, the NIH research effort in the development and testing of the 2009 H1N1 vaccine is an important part of the collaborative effort among the sister agencies of the Department of Health and Human Services, and we look forward to continuing this effort as we face the challenges ahead of us this fall and winter. Thank you very much, and I'd be happy to answer questions later. Thank you very much, Dr. Fauci. Dr. Goodman. <clears throat> Mr. Chairman and members of the committee, I very much appreciate the opportunity to be here today and describe FDA's role in this public health response. This ongoing collaborative response is the product of hard work and continuing investment made possible by Congress's support for preparedness activities in the Department of Health and Human Services. When the H1N1 virus emerged in the spring, we immediately established an incident command system to speed and coordinate our response. This allowed us to work hand in hand with HHS and my partners at the table here uh, to rapidly mobilize what has been an emergency public health response. And this included not just the vaccine enterprise that we began at that time, but allowing emergency use authorization for antivirals for ill children under one years old, uh, deploying a new diagnostic so that the, both the public health and healthcare system could accurately diagnose this infection. The very good news is that the initial doses of licensed vaccines will be available very, very soon and that full scale production is continuing. And these vaccines are made in exactly the same manner as the 100 plus million doses of seasonal vaccine that are made and used safely every year to help protect American people. Well, immediately after this virus was detected, uh, and as you saw on Dr. Fauci's chart, we all began working together to generate all the tools, including the virus reference strains, reagents, necessary to manufacture the virus. And we worked with our colleagues at NIH to design and mobilize those clinical studies, as well as with the manufacturers that you've heard about. Fortunately, this occurs on a background, and it's been mentioned here, of substantial investment that has helped us prepare better. 
Uh, we've engaged for several years in an effort to uh, strengthen influenza and public health system preparedness. And this has truly helped in this response. In the last five years, we've been able to virtually double the number of U.S. licensed manufacturers of vaccine and also their production capacity. And some examples of uh, some of these activities uh, under, undertaken uh, by us in conjunction with the Assistant Secretary for Preparedness and Response and the Biomedical Advanced Research and Development Authority under that office have included having a, a, as mundane as chickens, having a large flock of chickens available year round, uh, not to mention the roosters, uh, to help produce uh, large numbers of eggs. And this, in fact, was called into play in this very response. In addition, in May, we approved a new uh, facility for our U.S.-based manufacturer that markedly increased the ability to produce vaccine. Well, as a result of some of the work you've heard, on September 15th, FDA approved what we call supplements to the licenses of four U.S. licensed manufacturers of vaccines made to protect against this pandemic influenza A strain. This approval was consistent with how strain changes are approved each and every year for identically manufactured licensed seasonal flu vaccines. FDA is very experienced with the development and production of these vaccines, which are produced, as I said, by identical licensed processes and have an extensive track record of safety and effectiveness in the United States. And as Dr. Fauci mentioned, and as with the currently licensed seasonal flu vaccines, none of these vaccines contain an adjuvant because none was needed. Well, given the lack of measured background immunity to the 2009 virus circulating, as Dr. Fauci mentioned, clinical studies were undertaken so that we could be as informed as possible about how to use these vaccines. And as you have heard, the data available to date are very positive and show that, again, like seasonal vaccines, these, uh, a normal 15 microgram dose induces a good immune response that's likely to be protective, both in healthy adults and, and uh, older children, and the vaccine has been very well tolerated. I want to stress that these pandemic vaccines are subject to the same stringent manufacturing and quality oversight that's in place for licensed seasonal influenza vaccine. Make no mistake, we've worked very hard to get vaccine available as quickly as feasible, but no corners have been cut in this process. Each facility is expected annually for compliance with good manufacturing practices. Extensive in-process controls and product testing are required at multiple stages of manufacturing, and each lot of vaccine must be reviewed and tested by the manufacturer and results in samples of every lot provided to FDA. No lot of vaccine can be used until va testing is completed and it's released by the manufacturer and FDA. Now, I'm a bit over my time, but I do want to mention something about safety and safety monitoring since this is very important to everyone. We expect the potential side effects for the H1N1 vaccines to be mild and to be similar to those that follow the use of seasonal vaccines. Following a flu shot, uh, which in answer to the chairman's comment, you cannot get flu from, the flu shot is a killed virus that is then purified to get the component of the virus that can help protect you. The most common side effect of a flu shot is soreness at the site of immunization. Some individuals may develop mild fever, body aches, or fatigue that typically just lasts a few days. Following the nasal spray vaccine, which is a live, weakened virus that similarly cannot cause flu in an individual, Side effects may include runny nose, nasal congestion, sore throat, and fever. Although these kinds of mild reactions are to be expected, unexpected rare adverse events are a potential risk of any medical product, even those associated with such a long and excellent record of safety. It's important to realize that every day in the United States, some previously healthy people will have serious and unexpected medical events regardless of whether or not they have received a vaccine or any medical product. These are what we call background rates or cases of a disease that we would expect to see whether somebody receives a vaccine or not. It's important to realize that when a large number of people are going to get a product in a short period of time, we're gonna see many people who by chance alone may experience serious events which coincide with the time period following immunization. 
It will be challenging, but very important to keep aware of this and to distinguish such events from the, uh, that are expected to occur uh, coincidentally from some rare or unexpected event that could occur from immunization. Therefore, we're working with multiple partners, in particular CDC and HHS, to not only do the rigorous vaccine safety monitoring that we do every year and with every vaccine, but for this vaccine to expand that monitoring, uh, including numerous other partners of federal agencies, the Department of Defense, Veteran Affairs, uh, Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, our international partners, our state and local partners, and many others. So we're gonna have a very augmented safety surveillance system in place. Well, while we're gratified that this vaccine will soon be available, there are many opportunities to further develop the science and capacity that we need to enhance our preparedness. And I particularly uh, appreciated Mr. Ice's comments that this is a continue, that while this is an event this year, it's, it's continuing work to be prepared for this and similar other events that's going to keep our public health system and our people best protected. We clearly need more capacity, both in the US and globally, to produce vaccines. Uh, major investments by NIH at the basic science end, by HHS in advanced development on newer kinds of flu vaccines are already kicking in. Cell culture-based vaccines, recombinant vaccines, it's vaccines will provide us with increased capability. With your support in FDA's laboratories, we're working on methods that will speed the evaluation and testing of vaccines and that can help make vaccines available uh, sooner. As, as vaccines, though, are only part of the picture here, so while people tend to focus on them, we need to keep clear that there are lots of other opportunities. We need to take the opportunity to promote the development of new antivirals, rapid diagnostics, and enhance safety surveillance and a variety of public health tools. All of this will better prepare us for responding to the future threats that we know will also occur. So in conclusion, we're fully committed to and engaged in protecting public health during this very challenging time. Working together with our partners, we've made important progress in providing vaccines and other tools to help safely protect our population. Again, I thank you for the opportunity to be here today, and we welcome your questions. Thank you very much. Let me thank uh, all three of you for your, your testimony. Uh, let me just begin by, I guess, asking you, Dr. Frieden and uh, Dr. Fauci, should the American public be more frightened about the H1N1 influenza than the seasonal influence, influenza? H1N1 influenza is what we have spreading widely in the U.S. today, and so that's what uh, is the dominant strain. But the bottom line is that anyone who has a mild illness should know that for most people, neither testing nor treatment will be indicated. If, however, you're severely ill, you have difficulty breathing, or if you have an underlying condition, such as diabetes or heart disease or lung disease, children with certain uh, neuromuscular problems that make it harder for them to breathe, or women who are pregnant, then it would be quite important. If you have fever, flu-like symptoms, to get to see your doctor and get treated promptly, because that can make a big difference. And over the coming weeks, vaccine will become available and it is recommended that people get vaccinated. Seasonal flu kills approximately 36,000 people each year in our estimates. Although the pandemic influenza or H1N1 influenza is not affecting the same age groups, it's making many millions of people sick. Vaccine is our best tool, and until vaccine is available and even afterwards, there are some simple things that people can do to protect themselves, their families and their community. Stay home if you're sick. Doesn't do yourself or others around you a favor to go out if you've got a fever or coughing and can make others sick as well. Cover your cough when you cover your mouth when you cough or sneeze and wash your hands frequently. These three simple steps can make a big difference in how rapidly and widely flu spreads in a community. Up till now, we see that H1N1 is spreading more widely than seasonal flu generally does, and in somewhat different age groups. More young people affected, fewer older people affected. And the level of severity is no more than seasonal flu, but we also don't see it 
as being less than seasonal flu. Fachi. Yes, I just to reiterate, we should take all influenza seriously, both seasonal flu as well as the situation we're facing now with H1N1 pandemic influenza. As Dr. Frieden mentioned, the burden of disease in seasonal flu is 36,000 people each year die. 92 percent of them are elderly individuals, and the majority of those, when I say elderly, I mean older than 65, and the majority of them are 80 and older. So that, that is a, a, an important burden of disease in that age group. The difference, as you've heard from, from all of us with regard to H1N1, although it doesn't appear to be any more severe in general in the big picture than a seasonal flu, it has a propensity to infect younger individuals in greater quantities, and a certain percentage of them, unfortunately, would go on, a very small percentage, but nonetheless, any death in a young person is, is, is a tragedy. And under these circumstances, we're trying to avoid people getting infected by vaccination. And the, you know they, the target groups include pregnant women and younger individuals who are more vulnerable to what we call the complications of influenza. And that's the reason why we're, we want to stress the importance of people within those priority groups of getting vaccinated. So you ask, should we be worried and concerned? I would say that we should pay attention to it and follow the guidelines of the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. Yeah. This is to you, I guess, Dr. Goodman. Um, this vaccine, how can we be assured of its safety and if its effectiveness? Well, the good news is we were able to get vaccines made that are completely made in the identical way in the same license FDA overseen manufacturing facilities with all the same testing as the seasonal flu vaccines we use in over 100 million people every year. So these are very tried and true uh, vaccines. The safety record of them uh, has been outstanding over many years. Uh, in terms of their effectiveness, there are circumstances such as when the uh, flu va virus is different in the vaccine than what's out there, where the vaccine uh, is sometimes not as effective as we like. In this case, we believe the vaccine is likely to be highly effective. We won't know till it's used, but that's our belief based on the best science. And the reason for this is, number one, as Dr. Fauci has said, it induces a really strong and good immune response in the people who've been getting it. It's an immune response that typically correlates with protection against the virus and protection against some of the serious complications, like ending up in a hospital uh, or worse. The other reason is that, as Dr. Frieden said, all of our surveillance shows that up to now, this virus hasn't changed. So the virus and the vaccine strain used to make the vaccine is virtually identical to what's circulating out there. And under those circumstances, we expect vaccine to be effective. Thank you very much. My time has expired. I yield five minutes to the gentleman from California, Congressman Issa. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I think all the witnesses uh, did spend some time talking from terms of safety, perhaps because there's been so much additional concern for this new vaccine. Uh, let me go through a couple of, of quick questions. Uh, and. I'm going to be, try to be as accurate as I can at who answers them, but uh, the idea that, that healthcare professionals, first responders, and ho hospital personnel would be required to mandatorily receive these shots, can somebody make the case for that? Because there seems to be a very specific pushback from that industry of people who find the odds versus the, uh, the side effects unacceptable. The first thing Dr. to make clear is that there is no federal mandate for any individual to get vaccinated. Okay, so the Washington Post mandatory flu shots hit resistance uh, is is premature. No, there is no federal mandate. Okay, uh, at least one jurisdiction has mandated that unless there's a religious exemption or uh, a medical exemption, such as an allergy to eggs. Right that healthcare workers right. be vaccinated. And since all of you are at this level, can you make a case for why the, the state has a compelling interest for that, one state versus the other? In other words, if the state is right, then why aren't we doing it from this dais? And if the state is wrong, then are these people being adversely forced to do something that is probably outside the need of government? 
This is something that has been debated for some time, even before pandemic influenza came along this time around. And in fact, the mandate that uh, the state of New York implemented was prior to the emergence of H1N1 influenza and unrelated to it. The argument is a simple one and um, an important one. The evidence is clear that many patients become ill because they get infected with influenza from healthcare workers. Furthermore, healthcare workers are themselves at risk of contracting influenza at their workplaces and of bringing it home to their families. There are other vaccinations, such as measles, which are required of healthcare workers, and other annual programs, such as testing for tuberculosis infection, which are required of healthcare workers. Um, our sense is that this particular season, in the midst of a pandemic, is not the time at the federal level where we would start a new mandate along those lines. But the important point to make is we really do want healthcare workers to get vaccinated for their own protection, the protection of their families, and the protection so to, of their... So to do the cliff notes in my short five minutes, uh, you're not prepared to support it at this time, but you're not ruling out supporting it at a national level? Not this year. Okay. And uh, I'm going to leave all of you a copy of H.R. 1478, which is from the gentleman from New York, Mr. Henshi. Uh, and I just would like you to follow up. It's a bill that would make the armed forces and ultimately all government, uh, or the goal is to make all government entities liable for litigation for their actions. In other words, open them up to malpractice suits and the like. And I'd like you to respond on specifically relative to your agencies, which in enjoy liability limitation as government entities over and above all other narrow ones, how it would impact your agencies if you were fully able to be sued by the public, by class action lawsuits for any and all things which you decide to do. And, I, and, I'm, and I'm doing this for a reason. At, at a time of, uh, first of all, because I'm on the dais and it's my five minutes, but secondly, because at the time in which we're talking about health care, Mr. Kucinich talking so boldly about you're a public option, uh, there's a number of pieces of litigation or legislation coming through that would open up the government option to litigation. And I'd like each of you to, to give me your view of how you're able to do your job without having to worry about uh, excessively the fact that you might be sued for anything that goes wrong. And uh, if you could respond in writing, because I realize that's far more than you might be able to do. Last question is the H1N1 vaccine uh, is for a different group than the flu virus as a uh, vaccination as a whole. Could you give us your breakdown of, in an ideal world, if you only had 10 million or 12 million or 15 million doses, who should get it first? And, and I say this because we're dealing with seniors versus non-seniors, children who it's been reported actually have a lower incident of problem, and this unusual bulge called middle America healthy young people who seem to be at the highest risk and, and how that plays for our consideration of dollars and the public message. We're confident that eventually there will be enough vaccine for everyone to receive it who wants to receive it in terms of H1N1 influenza each year for seasonal flu. We vaccinate about 100 million people. There's also going to be enough seasonal flu vaccine around and anyone who wants seasonal flu vaccine can receive it really. For the H1N1 vaccine, there are five key priority groups. This doesn't mean that we deny it to other people, but we prioritize these groups, pregnant women, people with underlying conditions, healthcare workers, people who are contacts of people, of infants under the age of six who cannot themselves, under the age of six months, who cannot themselves be vaccinated, and then children and young adults age six months to 24 years. Okay, and Mr. Chairman, I, I, I think others may want to respond, but uh, I do want to thank you and mention that uh, in this case, since there's a controversy, I intend on getting one of these shots, if for no other reason than to show that I believe that it's safe and effective. Uh, if anyone else wants to respond. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very, very much. Um, at this time, I yield five minutes to the gentleman from Maryland, Mr. Cummings. Thank you very much, and thank you, gentlemen, for your excellent testimony. Uh, Dr. Fauci, um, one of the things that uh, um, I'm very concerned about the elderly. Uh, we have in my district probably 100 senior houses with at least four or 500 elderly. And I'm just wondering, um, they are locked into a situation. You know, they don't have isolation and things of that nature. 
I was with two groups of elderly people yesterday, and they expressed some concerns about the vaccine. And I'm just wondering, um, how do you, what is your advice to that population? You got some people who, like one gentleman said, he says, I'm stuck in my ways and I'm not sticking a needle in my arm. And I mean, that's what he said. And so I'm just, how do you deal with that population? Well, what we try to do is to explain to them in a way that's clear that they could understand the risk at their age of getting Let's talk with seasonal influenza first, because right. seasonal influenza is available right now. And since the elderly are the ones that suffer most from serious complications, I mentioned a while ago, just a moment ago, 36,000 deaths each year, the 92% of which are in individuals 65 years of age or older. I would encourage them to get this vaccine as soon as they can, even though they may have skepticism about vaccine. Whenever you make a decision, about an intervention versus what it might do for you. You do what's called a risk-benefit analysis. And I think if you look at the risk of a vaccine that has decades of a good track record for safety and the risk of an elderly individual who gets influenza coming up with serious complications, which might trigger a, a very difficult clinical course for them, in my mind and in the mind of people who do this every day, it's overwhelmingly weights towards getting vaccinated if you're an elderly individual. If you're thinking about H1N1, as Dr. Frieden just mentioned, there are five target groups. Of those target groups, since the elderly individuals greater than 65, if you look at what's happened over the spring and in the summer and in the southern hemisphere over the year, the individuals who are in that elderly group do not appear to be particularly susceptible to the H1N1. That doesn't mean that they shouldn't get it. We just would like to get the people who are in the five target groups vaccinated first, and then virtually anyone can get vaccinated. And as we all mentioned, we feel confident that we will have enough vaccine at the end of the day for everyone. Yesterday, the only other population I spent five hours with was the HIV population. Right. Uh, as you know, being from Maryland, uh, that 50% of all the HIV cases are in Baltimore. Yes. 90% of them are African American. Right. And you talked about trials still being conducted. Uh, and I know that you're not, uh, you don't have a magic ball, but do you uh, predict that they're going to, I mean, that it will be uh, safe for people with uh, suffering from HIV? Yes, I, I, I have little doubt that there would be any difference in the safety profile, Mr. Cummings, between the H1, excuse me, the HIV infected individuals and uninfected individuals. Uh, the issue when you are immunosuppressed, which is what HIV does, it, 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 it uh, diminishes your ability to respond immunologically, that they may not have as robust a response to the vaccine, but they could still get considerable benefit of it. And since they are an immune compromised group, even without clinical trials, I would like to see them get vaccinated as part of the group that's particularly susceptible for getting complications of it. Now, to piggyback on some comments of Mr. Kucinich and Mr. Issa, uh, to a degree, Mr. Issa, um, you know, do you, are you concerned that our health system will be able to appropriately, or any of you all can answer this, address these issues? I mean, we've got a lot of people uh, of course, with, with no insurance, we've got folks underinsured, we've got people who don't have as much access as, uh, to other, as others do to sufficient health care. Uh, is this a concern of yours? Is there a certain point where you see, can see us getting sort of overloaded with regard to these cases? And it seems like it takes, you get to a certain point with this disease, and it seems like it takes some intensive uh, medical care, and I was just wondering uh, where are we on that and what do you predict, and if such should take place, what plans do you have ready to go into operation? I don't want us to have another uh, Katrina-type situation where we say that we're ready for something, and then when the time comes, there is, we say, we'll wait for the rubber to meet the road, and then we discover there is no road. Right, right. Well, it, it will be, it, there will be challenges for sure, particularly when you have widespread outbreaks in various regions of the country, as we're seeing even right now in certain regions of the country. But uh, uh, Tom, you, you want to? I think the, the reality is that, <coughs> that our health care system doesn't currently have a good information system that would allow us, for example, to call back everyone who needs to be vaccinated. 
It doesn't have good coordination that would allow us to share information and share resources within areas in most parts of the country. And it doesn't emphasize prevention. So we have vaccination practices that aren't as good as we would like in some groups um, of doctors, for example, obstetricians, as we try to get pregnant women vaccinated. So I think the challenges that we face in healthcare, and I think everyone can, can identify many of those, are going to be played out in this. Also, the response is going to be a state-specific response. So states that are better prepared to operate a vaccination program, or which have uh, more resources for surge, will be better prepared to deal with it. The Health and Human Services, with support of the Congress, has provided more than uh, $3 billion in hospital preparedness over the past seven years for additional ventilators, for exercises, for surge planning and preparations. And I think we're much better off for those preparations that have occurred so far. But the challenges are real. The virus is, is um, um, potentially spreading rapidly. We do want to encourage people who are not severely ill and don't have underlying conditions not to go to emergency departments, because we've seen in parts of the country that where that happens, that can make it very di difficult for the emergency departments to manage. It is a shared responsibility between many different parties. Gentlemen's, gentlemen's time is expired. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. But we will have another round. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Gentleman from Ohio. But, uh, you know, that's precisely the point, though. We, we have a, a primary health care system which is not widely available to all Americans, with 47 million Americans without any insurance, and emergency rooms generally ending up as the place where people go to get care, and uh, at least those 47 million people. And so uh, you may say, uh, that we've spent three billion dollars to try to improve the surge capacity of America's hospitals. Uh, but so many America's hospitals right now are locked into a system where they're actually rewarded for turning people out of a hospital bed in a few days, whereas uh, if people are hit with a H1N1, they're quite likely to require extensive hospitalization. I just want to go back to the point that I made, Mr. Chairman, which I appreciate my colleague, uh, Mr. Cummings, uh, reiterating. And that is, we cannot forget the broader context of health care in America, which, where, where people are actually in a weakened state because of this for-profit system, because they don't have access to health care until they get really sick, and then the costs go through the roof. So yeah, I mean, this is, let's politicize this moment, because this is a, 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 one of those moments where we need to look at the bigger picture as we, the same time that we're looking at H1N1. I also want to ask Dr. Frieden, you know, we're talking, we're talking about H1N1 uh, vaccine here. Let's for a second go to the seasonal flu vaccine. Uh, we uh, lose about 36,000 people every year because of seasonal flu. The CDC website says that the initial distribution of vaccine every year at the beginning of the season is critical to protect those who are most vulnerable, such as the elderly, Mr. Cummings was mentioning. Now I'm hearing from our, uh, one of our staffers who's a a physician, uh, Dr. Lopez, in our Cleveland office, says that in Cleveland, chain pharmacies will have an ample supply of, of the flu vaccine, while doctors are still waiting for shipment uh, uh, that they, they would want to give to their patients. Have you heard about anything like this, and is this a nationwide uh, problem? In terms of the seasonal flu vaccine, there will be something on the order of 114 million doses available this year. There have already been more than 50 million doses distributed throughout the country. And while there may be some focal areas with shortages, there is going to be plenty of seasonal flu vaccine for anyone who wants it. The seasonal flu vaccination program is 90 percent through the private and voluntary sector and not through the government sector. The H1N1 response will be ordered a little differently uh, to try to ensure that there is access and efficiency to the system around it. In the seasonal flu vaccine, whoever orders first gets first. Uh, and so there, there sometimes are focal shortages in different areas, but the big picture is, at least for this year, for seasonal flu vaccine, there's plenty available. Well, we're hearing from doctors who say they've ordered it, and uh, uh, drugstore chains are getting in ahead of the doctors. Do you know how that happens? It, it has to do with when it's ordered, so the earlier in a season that uh, provider or pharmacy orders, the earlier they are likely to get it. As we have the H1N1 system, we're not using that system. We're using a different system, which will uh, give the state health 
Department of State government authority to authorize to where within the state it would go and provide equity across the state and the country in terms of availability as well as to try to get it out to places that don't usually vaccinate for H1N1 such as schools. Who's paying for that vaccine, the seasonal vaccine? That, um, seasonal vaccine is paid for as the healthcare system generally pays for things, a mix of payers. For H1N1, it's in, entirely paid for by the federal government. And so when it comes to, this, to the seasonal flu vaccine, uh, if, if it goes to the drug stores first or the chain stores, uh, isn't it possible that people could end up paying more for that than if they just went directly to their doctors? It would depend on the individual charges, doctors versus other providers. I really think that you should look into this thing where doctors who uh, deal with patients on a regular basis are having difficulty getting flu vaccine uh, and the uh, chain drug stores somehow are getting in ahead of the doctors. That doesn't seem uh, logical and it doesn't seem fair. Now, uh, the uh, CDC website says influenza vaccine production and distribution are primarily private sector endeavors. The Department of Health and Human Services and CDC do not have authority to control influenza vaccine distribution nor the resources to manage such an effort. That's a quote. Can you please clarify who in the private sector controls who gets the vaccines first? The CDC provides guidance and some resources for planning. Ultimately, it's a decision of each doctor, each medical provider, each pa patient of whether or not to order the vaccine and whether or not to give it or receive it. But who in the private sector controls who gets the vaccine first? You didn't answer the question. It, it depends on when it's ordered. So the, the earlier orders get filled first in general. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. I now yield five minutes to the gentlewoman from California, Congressman Diane Watson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for holding this most significant and critical uh, hearing. I just got to follow up on something that my colleague Kucinich uh, said. You know, this has to be a teaching moment as well, because uh, I just saw a television uh, advertisement saying we don't want government to run health care. What would happen, <laughs> you know, if this particular flu spreads across as, as it is doing now and if government wasn't there. We are indeed the safety net. Now let me get into what I uh, was prepared to say. Uh, as a result of the nation's economic uh, conditions and an ensuing uh, budget crisis, my state, the state of California, has had to make millions of dollars in cuts to our state and our local health departments and programs uh, is there any fear that the economic crisis that states such as California, and there are others too, are facing will have an effect on pandemic uh, preparedness or their ability to effectively and efficiently distribute the H1N1 vaccine? And thank you so much, uh, experts, for using H1N1. And we're trying to teach our constituents that it is not the swine flu. So thank you for reinforcing H1N1. Can you respond? Yes, we are uh, quite concerned about the state of uh, state and local public health departments. Mm -hmm. We've seen decades of underinvestment in public health and the public health infrastructure that has been exacerbated over the past couple of years with the economic crisis. So we are seeing layoffs, attrition, furloughs, freezes in terms of hiring. This makes it even more challenging to implement the vaccination and overall response program. We have provided now, or in the process of providing now, uh, nearly $1.5 billion to state and local governments for preparation, planning, and vaccine administration. We're providing the vaccine free of charge along with the needles and alcohol and disposal equipment that it would be needed with it. We're providing technical assistance and guidance. And I think we will inevitably see some variability in the different states with some uh, better prepared and others less well prepared. The CDC has staff on the ground in the field in virtually every state in the country. And we provide whatever, whatever assistance we can but again, it is a shared responsibility, and the state government, state government does have responsibilities, as do the local governments, as does the federal government. My concern is that uh, being the largest state in the union 
and California being the first state that is a majority of minorities, and most of our immigrants come across the Pacific, uh, and not always over our southern border, and people are coming already infected or not having one day of uh, health care. And so it hits our state with a greater wallop than a lot of others because of the demographics. Uh, during the initial H1N1 outbreak in the spring, it's important to note that there are probably a lot of people who actually contacted the H1N1 virus, but never got it specifically diagnosed. And that relates to what I, what I just told you about the demographics. Believing it to be the unusual seasonal uh, flu virus. And do those people who have unknowingly uh, had the H1N1 flu have the potential of any extra risk or complications when getting vaccinated? For most people with average flu, there's no reason to be tested or treated. So the fact that uh, they weren't is not going to harm them. However, anyone who's severely ill or who has underlying conditions should be promptly attended to to reduce the risk of severe illness. So most people who had the flu in the spring won't know whether it was H1N1 or not. We recommend that they all get vaccinated. And uh, there is no reason to suspect that the vaccine would be uh, risky or riskier for people who have had the infection before. No, Dr. Fauci. No, I, actually not at all. I, I agree completely with Dr. Frieden. If you have gotten H1N1, in, for example, in the spring in school, we'll say, and then we come back now and you want to vaccinate a child, first of all, the vast majority of times you won't definitively know that you had H1N1, though you could assume it if it was rampant in the community. But there's no evidence scientifically at all that suggests if you then get vaccinated with a vaccine against H1N1 that you are at any greater risk for any toxicity or any adverse event. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, and now you have five minutes to the gentleman from Virginia, Mr. Connolly. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And thank you for holding this hearing on a subject that's so important to the American public and to American public health. Uh, and welcome to the panel. Uh, in 1917, the original uh, influenza strain that struck in Kansas was mild, not severe, eerily similar to the way you described this strain, and involved initially in, in the town it hit no fatalities. Is that not correct? The best available evidence is that the, the first wave or waves of the pandemic in 1917 to 19 right. were mild, followed by and, severe waves. And as I understand it, what changed, what allowed the the strain to become lethal was it, it, it jumped into uh, mustering camps. We, it just so happened the United States was now mustering large groups, concentrated groups in overcrowded conditions of young men who were being trained to go to the trenches in France in World War I. And when the influenza strain went from that Kansas town to the nearby uh, military camp, it transmuted into something far more lethal that led to many deaths and then spread around the country. Is that true? There's uh, a lot of different theories about what happened in 1918-19. It's clear that crowded conditions such as barracks uh, are breeding grounds for influenza as well as other infectious diseases. There are some theories that it was actually demobilizing individuals coming back to the U.S. that may have brought the flu why there was apparently a mild spring wave followed by a severe fall wave is, as far as I know, not definitively known, and perhaps Dr. Fauci would like to comment further. No, it, it really is all theory and hypothesis. Of note, which people don't fully appreciate, is that the virus that was in that early spring wave, as they call it, that virus has never been isolated or identified. The virus that hit like a vengeance in the late summer and fall of 1918, that virus has been dug up and sequenced and we know what that virus is. We have no idea what the relationship between that virus is and the virus from the spring because we've never had any isolates that have been molecularly analyzed. So it really is just a, a big theory that we... So, 
So, Dr. Fauci, they could have been actually two different strains. It absolutely could have been okay. two. Yeah. Now, you touched on the fact that you've got sort of five targeted groups in terms of vaccination for H1N1. And, and I was heartened to hear you say that the recognition included in there that actually it seems to affect the over 65 population less severely than some others. That was a characteristic of the pandemic of 1918 as well, was it not? That actually the most affected group in terms of severity and lethality was actually the sort of 15 to 35 with where, when young people's immune system was at the peak performance but it kind of went into hyperdrive and overreacted to the introduction mm -hmm. of this, and a lot of young people turned out to be more vulnerable. Is that well, correct? It's, it's a very interesting question. There are two aspects to what you said. If you have a 65 or 70-year-old person who is less susceptible to getting infected in the first place, it is likely that that person, during the experience in their lives, decades and decades before, came into contact with a virus that had some degree of similarity, which provided for them a background type of immune response so that they were able to avoid infection with the particular virus. In fact, this may be exactly what's going on right now with elderly individuals who seem less prone to get infected with H1N1 because of prior experiences that they have had during their years, either of previous exposures to viruses or even previous vaccinations that they may have had. That's one issue. The other issue, which dates back to the hypothesis from 1918, is that young people who do get infected have such a vigorous inflammatory and immunological response that it is conceivable, though not completely proven, but not an unreasonable hypothesis, that the actual response to the virus in a vigorous, healthy young person allows for a greater damage to the lung tissue and an outpouring of inflammatory cells. Right. So there are two issues going on. There's prior right. exposure and the strength of your immune response. So, and certainly the, the accounts from 1918 are legion of precisely that right. phenomenon. Exactly. Young people healthy in the morning and dead by night. Right. Um, but let me just ask a final question. But this has implications for if you will, triage and the distribution of a vaccine, should it be in short supply? A few years ago, for example, we had a scarcity of flu vaccine, you will recall. And automatically the protocol was, all right, whatever supply we've got is, is targeted for the most vulnerable, people over 65 and very young. Right. In this particular case, that would be the wrong model, would it not? Right, and that, that's exactly what we're most concerned about and exactly what we're doing, which is to prioritize to the groups that would be at highest risk of severe illness and also to monitor very intensively. So every day, samples are sent to CDC and we analyze the data to see whether we've seen any change in the level of severity or in the genetic pattern of the virus that would suggest that it could become more deadly. And the good news is that up till now, we have not seen any significant change in the pattern of the virus, nor in the pattern of illness in people. I thank the chair. Thank you very much. I now yield five minutes to the gentleman from Maryland, Congress, Congressman Van Hollen. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I also want to thank all the witnesses uh, for their testimony. I really want to pick up uh, on the question of uh, Mr. Connolly, and first to get some of the facts in terms of the age distribution uh, of the impact of this disease, because that does seem to be very different than the kind of flus that we've been used to uh, addressing. Uh, with respect to the, the 593 deaths so far from this H1N1, is, first, is that the number that you have? Is that correct, 593 deaths in the United States? That was the close. Out there. We continue to count deaths each okay. week, so the number continues and to what increase. is the age distribution? Dr. Fauci has said that with respect to uh, seasonal flu, as I understood it, about 92 percent plus uh, deaths were in the 65 plus age range, with a lot of those being in the 80 plus. With respect to the deaths so far from H1N1, what would what's the age? We've seen very few uh, deaths in people over the age of 65. There have been about 50 plus deaths in uh, children under the age of 18, and then the bulk have been in that that uh, young to middle age group. Right. About two thirds to 70 percent have been among individuals who have underlying medical conditions such as diabetes or uh, lung disease, asthma, or other problems. And the level, the hospitalizations have followed a similar pattern, although slightly different in terms of 
people with asthma may be being hospitalized more, but less likely to die. People with diabetes or underlying conditions more likely to, okay. unfortunately, tragically die. So, I mean, based on those figures, it sounds like almost the reverse of the normal seasonal flu in terms of age impact. Um, it's the reverse of um, most seasons with different, there are different types of flu, and this, the H1, that particular type of flu characteristically does affect younger people more than older people, even if it's not the pandemic strain. Right. Now, if, if our theory that one of the reasons elderly people don't, aren't as severely impacted is because they've had earlier seasonal flus or they've had earlier uh, vaccines that may have helped them, it does suggest that this strain is very different than the strains we've been seeing for a very long period of time. Because otherwise, I assume they would, that, that's why they've, that's why young people are, are feeling it and they're not, is the, that right? The, yeah. Well, it is very different, but there is some strong suggestion that individuals who are elderly have of percentages high as 30, 35 percent of them have antibodies that actually would cross-react with this flu, even though we've never seen in our history anything like this in the sense of an identical virus like this. There have been other H1N1s. There have been people who've gotten vaccinated against the swine flu in 1976. There are people who have gotten uh, exposed to H1N1 years and years ago. It is highly likely uh, that those individuals do have some degree of subliminal background immunity that when they see this virus, they mount a reasonably good immune response, whereas the young youngsters, children, adolescents, people in their 20s, that doesn't seem to be the case. It spreads very widely through them. Right. Just in terms of the rate of transmission right now, before, uh, how does it compare to the seasonal flu? Is it there's moving? there's a, a fair amount of data, some of it conflicting about that. What we do know is that we don't see the kind of explosive outbreaks in schools and colleges in most flu seasons that we're seeing now. In New York City, we had one school that had over 1,000 kids who had H1N1. And we just don't see that. So certainly in some populations, the younger adults and children, it seems to spread quite readily sometimes. Right. Uh, but the overall rate of spread is, is not entirely clear. It just and following up on that and getting to the, the, the question of the adequacy of our state and uh, local public health response, I hope that although this is a, uh, the distribution happens at the local and state level uh, with the support that you're providing at the federal level. I hope that uh, you will monitor very closely uh, the local impacts and in some ways hold people accountable. As you said, there's going to be some variability, but it, it seems to me we have a responsibility at the federal level uh, to make it clear where we do not think that the local response is adequate. Uh, and I, I hope that all of you will agree that that is a responsibility of the federal government. I mean, sometimes it's not easy. You're going to have to be calling out shortcomings in terms of uh, the local response. But in the interest of the public health, it seems to me uh, we should have some kind of grading system or some kind of way uh, to identify who is responding adequately and who's not, with res especially with respect to uh, schools where you've got a lot of young people obviously gathered. And this is a uh, a, a strain of the flu that has a very severe impact potentially on young people. We'll certainly do everything we can to support states and localities to respond effectively and provide whatever support is possible. I think that there will be attention to the areas that are not vaccinating, vaccinating large numbers or, or where vaccine is more difficult to, to obtain. There are going to be real challenges, particularly in the next few weeks as the vaccine program just begins to roll out, including to places that don't usually vaccinate, such as schools. Thank you. Gentlemen, time has expired. Uh, we have a second round. Um, in fact, all of the witnesses, you know that vaccinations often bring a fear to many groups. And the ability to spread false information uh, is always prevalent. What information have you come across regarding this flu strain or this vaccine that you believe is false or confusing? Uh, do you wish to clear up today? Cause I just received a call um, uh, earlier today asking me, if it was a farmer, 
saying, please stop referring to uh, this as a swine flu, uh, because people think they get it from pork. So I, I think that uh, these are things that, you know, I'd like for you to clear up. This is an opportunity for you to do so, because we want to make certain that accurate information is getting out there. And being we have the experts here, uh, we want to make certain that people know exactly what's going on. And the other thing that people are saying, which in, is, I find this one very interesting, that if you want to avoid it, uh, don't live in the South. You go to a cold area and that you don't have to worry about it. So I guess if you went to Niagara Falls, I guess it would not be a problem, you know, according to what information that's being passed on out there by people. So uh, I would like for you to take this opportunity to clear up this so people will know exactly what we're dealing with here. Uh, because as you know, there's some people when it comes to vaccinations and uh, anything of that sort, they just don't want to participate. So right down the line. I'll I'll start and then my colleagues, I'm sure, will add to it. First, in terms of the spread, it's, it's very different in different parts of the country and it will change from time to time. Currently, it is more prominent in some states than others, but it's widespread across the U.S. There's more in the south of the U.S., possibly because schools went back into session sooner. There are at least three common myths about flu which are important to confront. First, you cannot get the flu from a flu shot. Not possible. It's killed vaccine and there's no way you can get the flu from it. You can get a sore arm, but you can't get the flu from a flu shot. And that is perhaps one of the more common misconceptions. The second, which is common and, and problematic, is that flu is not necessarily a mild illness. It's not the common cold. It can knock you flat on your back and make you quite sick for a while. You can miss school, work, and if you're unfortunate or have an underlying condition, it can put you in the hospital or even kill you. So flu needs to be taken seriously. You can't get the flu from a flu shot, and the flu shot is highly protective against what is, what can be, and is for many people, uh, a moderate illness that is unpleasant. And third, in the public settings for the H1N1 vaccination program, which will start in a few weeks, the public settings, immunization clinics, schools, vaccine administration and the vaccine itself will be free to the person being vaccinated. They may bill your insurance company or Medicaid, but uh, no one will have to pay for it out of pocket in the public sector vaccine clinics. It may be that the private sector sometimes has co-payments and we've encouraged them to waive those for uh, H1N1 vaccination and many insurers have agreed to do that. But at least for the public sector, it'll be free, and the vaccine itself will be free everywhere. There may be some administration fees in the private sector. Just to add an another one to Dr. Frieden's is that we've heard, and I'm sure you have, Mr. Chairman, about some people who feel maybe it's a good idea to actually deliberately expose yourself to get infected. Uh, you heard about flu parties, people getting people together, like you have these chicken pox parties. That's really a bad idea. It's a bad idea because, as Dr. Frieden said, influenza can be a very bad disease. Even uh, at its best sometimes, it makes you very uncomfortable and puts you uh, out of sorts, if not out of school and out of work. And also, even though there's a very small percentage of people who go on to real serious complications, you can't predict who that's going to be. So the idea about getting infected deliberately is a real bad idea. What's a real good idea is to get vaccinated. I think one very important uh, myth here is that somehow vaccines in general, and in particular this vaccine, may be unsafe for pregnant women. And I think it's very important to realize that uh, pregnant women uh, have been among the groups most overrepresented in having serious outcomes uh, for themselves and their uh, offspring uh, with this flu. And these vaccines, although there aren't a lot of formal studies uh, in pregnant women, have been safely used every year in hundreds of thousands of pregnant women and studies that have been performed about their use uh, have not shown any increases in adverse outcomes for the moms or their babies. So there's not a known risk to pregnant women. We certainly continue to collect more data. There is certainly a known risk to pregnant women and their babies from getting this flu. Uh, just very quickly, um, uh, because my time has expired, 
I know that it's not a federal policy, but as you know, some states are requiring uh, that the uh, public health workers uh, that they uh, receive vaccination. And let me uh, ask, are you monitoring this? Because I think that uh, it's something that really needs to look, be looked at and, and, and to see whether or not there's uh, any value you know, to this. So are you monitoring it? There are a lot of important studies and they're ongoing that we continue to track that identify what are the risks to patients if the healthcare workers who provide their care don't get vaccinated. And uh, perhaps the experience from the jurisdictions that are doing this will uh, be helpful in trying to understand that further. All right. Okay. Gentleman from California, Mr. Issa. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I'll reiterate a question for emphasis here. Pregnant women are among the most vulnerable. They're the ones that have the most natural reluctance to take any and all substances that are not you know, grown in the ground, cut off, and freshly cleaned. How is it, when, when I hear the, the list of who should get it first, that isn't first. Why isn't that the group that most of you need to make sure are first heard as the, because they have a reluctance, even if they're only among the top, shouldn't they be the first that you say, pregnant women or those who expect to be, may become pregnant, shouldn't that be the first group with their high immune uh, and their, particularly on H1N1, their, their likelihood to fight more aggressively the disease? We don't uh, distinguish among those five priority groups. All of them are equally high priority, and for each of them we have that's a... Like, that's like going to school and A through F being equal. But we, I know there's a subtle difference between a, a 91 and a, a 59, but it made all the difference in the world when I was going to school. For each of them, it's important that we reach out. So we've worked with the American College of Obstetrics and Gynecology to help get vaccine out and promote vaccination for pregnant women. We're working with uh, um, um, magazines, mother's magazines, net resources, and others. For each of those groups, I think there's a special uh, Effort. There is a special effort to try to reach out to them most appropriately. The bulk of the people who have severe illness and death from H1N1 are not pregnant women, but pregnant women are at six or eight-fold increased risk of severe, uh, severe and, and negative outcomes. And so we do want to really prioritize vaccination in this and other groups, although we do understand that there's, there is reluctance and will be. Yeah, Mr. Sainz, it, it would be logistically really a problem to have your first, your second, your third, because if you have distribution centers that are actually giving vaccines and someone is among those five target groups that we've all mentioned during this testimony, that if a pregnant woman walks in and says, I want to get vaccinated, she will get vaccinated because not only is she among the five target groups, she's even among the five priority groups within the target groups. And, and, and within the, the, that, is there a, a difference in trimester? Uh, has there been any study showing that, that level of, of vulnerability just before delivery versus early gestation? Of when you could have it? The, the, no, no, no. Okay, no, so no it's just all. all pregnant right. women. Let me uh, do one follow-up question. Since the former chairman of this committee isn't here today, and since he has been an outspoken critic of uh, the side effects, real and or alleged, uh, of heavy metals in vaccines, can you discuss the level of, of, of uh, you know the right term for the, the small amount of metal that's sort of part of the carrier in many vaccines, as to both today's flu vaccines and uh, 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 obviously the H1N1, and, and particularly as to the, uh, the claim that autism can often be caused by that and other birth defects. I think we'll, we'll all comment briefly. Uh, thimerosal is what you're referring to. The amount of thimerosal in vaccine has uh, fallen substantially in recent years. We will have a substantial amount of thimerosal-free vaccine in this uh, H1N1 Program. Substantial They're, amount, some yes, some no. So a patient can say, I only want metal-free so or thimerosal-free. Thimerosal free. is used as a preservative in multi-dose vials. In single-dose vials, it's not necessary by and large. There have been a series of scientific studies that have not linked thimerosal with autism. Autism is a very serious problem, and it's a tragic problem for the parents who have to deal with it often. But uh, we need to continue to 
make efforts to identify the causes and ways of preventing it. There is good data that suggests or indicates that there is no link between vaccine and autism. However, because we want to accommodate the concerns of people who believe there may be, and we want as many people to get vaccinated as possible, we've made thimerosal free vaccine available to the extent possible. Since you have to have a preservative in a multi-dose vial, it's not possible to eliminate it completely. Uh, so those, those who might otherwise not get a shot should ask for a single dose thimerosal free dose, and it should be reasonably available on request. Yes. Yes, sir. Yes, doctor. I would just, though, <clears throat> add to that that while there is an effort, uh, as Dr. Frieden said, to get as much preservative-free vaccine as possible, uh, I think that particularly for people in risk groups, if there is vax, you, you make your own choice, but given that there is no known risk and that uh, scientific community, including the Institute of Medicine in 2004, found there was no connection between thimerosal and autism, that it would, people should consider carefully the idea of not getting vaccinated because of this concern. Right. And, and in closing, doctors, I asked the question, one, because one member of, not here at the dais is terribly supportive of the theory that there is still a connection, uh, and I don't want to say that he's wrong because I'm not qualified. But I think for everyone that will look at this hearing, being aware that if you have a young child or a pregnant uh, woman who has that concern, that there is a way to get us past that concern. And understand that this, if you're a member of Congress, you get hit every day or every month by somebody who wants the fluorine out of the water, too. Uh, that, that in fact, there is an interest group against almost anything you can name. And if it spreads into a portion of society that would not protect themselves, then I think that's where we have the interest for the question. I appreciate your understanding. And I thank you, Mr. Chairman, for giving us this opportunity. And yield back. You, the gentleman from Maryland, Congressman thank, Cummins. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I want to just, I want us to put a microscope for a moment on the uh, first category of people between, uh, at high risk, between 25 through 64 who are at a higher risk for complications of uh, H1N1 infection because of chronic disorders that compromise the immune system. You know, you're on C-SPAN here. Why don't you tell us exactly what those diseases are? Because one, the reason why I'm saying that is we got 26.6 million people in the United States with diabetes who probably, unless a doctor tells them that they are high risk, they may not know it. We've got people who are on chemo with cancer. And of course, chemo, you know, you all, you're the doctors and never spent one day in medical school. But I do know that chemo can compromise the immune system. Is that right? Um, of course, we've already talked about AIDS. I want you all to tell the American people See, if I got 8% of the population that has diabetes and don't even know that they're at high risk, I want to make sure that these, the other folks using this wonderful opportunity we have here, we need to let them know that they are at high risk right now. Could you tell us what those diseases are that we're most concerned about? Anyone who, as you say, has diabetes, anyone who has a chronic heart conditions such as congestive heart failure, anyone with a chronic lung condition that would make it harder for them to breathe such as emphysema or asthma, anyone who has immune compromise such as being on cancer chemotherapy or someone with HIV, anyone with a neuromuscular disorder, someone who has trouble breathing on their own myasthenia gravis or other problems that cause a weakening of the musculature people with underlying health conditions which give them less reserve to call upon if they become infected with influenza are more likely to end up in the hospital and more likely to die. And that's why these groups are so important uh, to be vaccinated when vaccine becomes available. And if someone in one of these groups becomes sick with fever, with cough, so important that they get treated promptly, ideally within 48 hours. And how are we getting that word out? Are we telling doctors that? I mean, 
I'm yeah. telling you, I'm, I'm sure there are people watching this right now yeah. saying, wait a minute, diabetes, I, you know. And the reason why I'm so concerned about that is because there is so much diabetes in my district. Right. And I'm sure a lot of districts. And, you know, when you say, you know, somebody who's in that top category, when you said diabetes automatically it jumps out at me. But go ahead, yeah, Dr. Well, Fauci. We're, we are trying and, and, and we appreciate the opportunity to say what, Dr. Frieden just said at a hearing like this that is on C-SPAN. That's one way of getting it out. Virtually every day we talk about this. The CDC has, a, and I could say that because I'm not from the CDC, has a beautiful website that you click on and they just list them all. And we keep talking about it from Secretary Sebelius herself down to the people who are doing the clinical trials in the trenches. So this is something we constantly talk about. But I agree with you. We have to keep shouting it from the hills so people understand that because a lot of people who are in the risk categories don't really fully appreciate that they are. And I think you mentioned one of the most important ones are diabetics. And they're probably, you know, if, if diabetics are 8% and then when we put in all of those other people that you all just mentioned, we may be talking about 25% of the population. Is that is that unreasonable figure? Is it? No, that's, that's, that's close. That's just in the first category. In your testimony, I think it was you, Dr. Fauci, you said that, and correct me if I'm wrong, that Karen H1N1 vaccine does not contain adjuvants, right. uh, which would increase the potency of vaccines, but you are testing them as well. Uh, we include adjuvants in, in our seasonal flu shots, is that right? No. We don't? No. Okay, and there's a rumor that we will run out of this vaccine is seen as soon as we produce it. That's not true either? That's not the right rumor. That's a rumor. It's not correct. Okay. Yeah, we, we fully expect that we will have enough vaccine of the H1N1 2009 for all who want or need it. And we certainly will have enough of the seasonal influenza vaccine based on the history of uptake of seasonal flu vaccine. So we feel confident that we will have enough for everyone who wants and needs it without the use of adjuvants. I go back to... Uh, what I said a little bit earlier, um, I, I do believe that sometimes, it's not your office, I'll be very brief, Mr. Chairman, that we operate in, sadly, in a, a culture of mediocrity in our country. And I will never forget Katrina as long as I live. And I just want to make sure that, going back to my friend and colleague from Maryland, what Mr. Van Hollen said, I just want to make sure that we hold our entire, all of our agencies accountable. And I know that may be difficult to do, but I agree with him. We, we cannot have another situation where we think we've got under, everything under control and we don't. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. Um, let me just uh, uh, ask one question because I think, um, Dr. Fauci, you sort of mentioned it. Who has the best and most current information for the public in terms of website or videos, Twitter, whatever. Who has that? I mean, I think we need to put down the record because yeah. uh, and let people hear it. Okay. Uh, I go to the CDC website every day. <laughs> they, they are a fount of information and I would recommend that if anyone wants to know anything about the kinds of things we're talking about right now, it's, an, it's very, very easy. It's flu.gov flu.gov. Just click on that and it's there. You could just search anything you want that has to do with flu, all the things we're talking about, risk categories, vaccines, etc. Right. Because I think that's important. We're trying to make certain that people have accurate information, you know, and that's what this is all about. So I want to thank you, the witnesses, uh, again for being here uh, today. And of course, we want to get this information out. I would also like to thank uh, you for the work that you're doing on this issue as well. And I'm certain that the American people will thank you uh, also. And let me uh, 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 thank you again for um, uh, the time that you've spent here with the committee and, and answering all the questions that we've, we've raised. So at this point in time, without any further questions or objections, the committee stands adjourned. Mm-hmm, thank you.